Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Latest Shiny Podcast. Uh, this is Stephen Spector, your host. And of course, with me as usual is uh, Rob Hirschfeld. Rob, uh, how are you doing? Stephen, I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I'm doing good. Well, we had a long three-day weekend. Uh, of course, this goes out later, but it was Memorial Day weekend. And uh, I think, you know, we always talk about Rob getting amazing guests, but this may be the most amazing of amazing. And I'd like to welcome Simon Crosby, the CTO of uh, SWIM. You know, Edge has really been a focus and, and getting Simon on the call and this podcast is just, I think this is going to put us over the top in Edge. So Simon, welcome to the uh, podcast. Thank you, Stephen. Great to be with you, Rob. So Simon, real quick, if you can just do a quick 30 seconds, I don't know if that's possible, but a quick 30 second overview of um, what you're working on a little bit and then, uh, you know, Rob and we'll jump right in. Yeah. So SWIM is radically changing the approach to edge computing and edge data by solving phenomenally important problems on wave thin amounts of compute um, almost without the cloud. <laughs> so it's a, it's a complete rethink of, of edge architecture, of architecture in general, based on um, a very simple thing which is very well known um, called the distributed actor model which we know if we know Akka, or if you know Erlang, say you're a class five guy from Ericsson, or if you were a gamer and you play Halo 4, and Microsoft used it in Orleans. So it's a very simple, tiny code base, which computes locally, learns locally, and delivers insights from data right out the edge. Wow, okay, so, <laughs> Everybody listening, go get some popcorn and a drink and settle in. I, we've got about two hours in front of us, uh, but we're going to condense it into a lot less than that. Simon, wow. Um, I'm not even sure where to begin unpacking that. I, I think it would be worth taking a step back. Um, and I'm a huge Erlang fan, so I, I love the reference to Erlang and the actor models. Um, but step back and why is edge a hard problem like what what makes edge and and for, for people listening this is going to be a do your homework um I, you know we're not going to define edge we're not going to talk through sort of the 101 stuff uh we only have simon for a little bit of time so you know simon why does edge why is edge hard how are, why why is this problem you know how are you approaching the problem and to solve that it's hard about it Let, let's divide edge into two worlds there's old edge and new edge. <clears throat> new edge is for cloud native apps where the data either is already in the cloud or it's coming to the cloud, say from my phone, right? Those ones, we get it. That the stuff is there and the cloud boys will build that. Old edge is the enterprise as we know it, which is drowning in vast amounts of data. Most of it hits the floor. Um, and yet everybody believes that there are some hidden insights in there which could really transform productivity or safety or whatever. Um, and yet nobody knows what to do. And so the received wisdom from the industry, from the cloud folks, all of whom are chasing enterprises, is that the enterprise should <clears throat> gather all this data, squirt it up into the cloud, get a data scientist, clean it up, whatever, train some models, push the models back to the edge and, and everybody will be smarter. And it, that is a problem. So you're defining edge in this case as, for, as an enterprise problem, not an IoT problem? Do you I, see? Hmm, it's both. And certainly the architecture I'm going to tell you about has enormous opportunities for both. But, but certainly edge as in an enterprise problem is um, is dominant. There are trillions of dollars of stuff in the ground um, with sensors, all of which pump out tons of data. Right. Uh, and then there's all the new stuff, right? All the widgets going in your home and your phone and everything else. Right. Um, the, the architecture I'm going to describe is really cool and is applicable to both. The fundamental challenge that we have is getting data from the edge to the cloud if it is not a cloud native app. So, but once it's in the cloud, I mean, you're, you're, that's, a, that's a data collection aggregation perspective. 
my expectation is that, that you want to talk about act, making, making local action. Is that not a concern for you? Oh, I do. Yes. So okay. let me give you, let's make it really practical. Okay. The city of Palo Alto, California generates four terabytes a day just from a few hundred traffic lights. Okay. Getting that data up to AWS and into Lambda and learning on it. We'll talk about learning a bit. It, you know, it's about a $5,000 a month problem. Okay. That's too expensive. <laughs> okay. okay. More than so that. Just, just, you're, you're literally saying just the ingress of, of the data <laughs> from this environment is so expensive that we just, you basically just turn it off and ignore right. it. Okay. Right. Right. And, and so the question is, what can you, by the way, I'm dealing with another customer, which is <clears throat> operating large uh, turbines for gas okay. compression, and they generate 70 data points per degree of rotation of a shaft. There are four shafts per compressor, and they go 1,000 RPM, 360 days a year. Right. And these That's guys, did, so they thought, cool, we'll do this in a MongoDB, and then <laughs> now, they're now up to two rotations per hour that the Mongo can actually capture, which is a fact, <laughs> uh, order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude too small for the actual amount of data being, being generated. Right. Right. And so, so something where people take a traditional data approach to these types of data problems is it's orders of, it's, it's multiples orders of magnitude off today. Correct. That's, is that a sort of a, and so, so this is one of those, what you're describing here is not a, oh, we just need to make better SQL databases or better NoSQL databases. You're saying this isn't, this isn't solvable by incremental progress on the current data models. It's a, it's a, it's doubly, it's two orders of magnitude. So it's a complete disruption. Correct. Into what people are thinking. <clears throat> yep. Okay. And, but more than that, the amount of data relative to the value is something important. So people in general in these next generation edge scenarios looking for marginal benefits, not first order benefits, right? So these okay. guys want a quarter of a percent better yield on their capex. So if they get an extra day per year out of their, their compressor, they're happy. Wait, wait, wait. I, that's, that's a fraction of a percent improvement is sufficient for ROI? Oh, sure. Because this is a billion dollars of capex. Okay. And in most of these examples, it's completely lost opportunity. So I used to deal with some oil, oil field type stuff. And if the, if the pipes aren't flowing, they, they look at it as completely lost revenue. It's not like, not like they're working. You know, they don't think they're going to make it up tomorrow. It's just gone. Go ahead. You're, you're, you're looking at the same types of scenarios. Yep. Okay. But right. I think it's also, it's also fair to say that in gen I'm going to pitch in a way of thinking about the edge as well as what we do. Um, in general, you know, the edge is getting smarter and there are new cool widgets. You know, the edge is just as well served by Moore's law as the cloud is. In fact, the most expensive thing you can rent today in the cloud is a GPU. Right. Yeah. That $5,000 a month problem that I just described in AWS is absolutely trivially nailed with a once-off purchase of an NVIDIA Jetson, which has got a small GPU and an ARM core on it, which is 200 bucks. So we're, we're back to a capital cost in the field to do local processing. Cheap, 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 right? Especially by comparison of renting a GPU in one of the cloud providers is what, what you're describing. Does that, yeah. do you mean that for, for model training also? Right, because the way I've, way I've been hearing people talk about edge is that you have a training problem, which the cloud should be able to solve really well, and then you have a model using pro problem, which the edge can solve really well. Do you, do you make that distinction? Okay, well, t let's tee that one up now. I'm sure okay. you're gonna dig into all these things. <laughs> um, so I am convinced that this notion of training things in the cloud and then push them to the edge is a waste of time, okay? There are not enough people on the planet to do this for all the things that we want to do with data on the edge. What we have to be able to do is learn on the fly. So this notion of training and then pushing models around is kind of, 
it, it, it's yesteryear's thinking. Okay, so this the, the let's just say the state of the art of of time series learning um, now allows us to learn on the fly from scratch without knowing anything. So a system that predicts what's going to happen with the traffic lights in Palo Alto can also predict when batteries will fail in a battery backup scenario and has no idea what a voltage is or a car. It, and so I'm, I'm going to give, give listeners a homework check on this because you went into a lot of detail when you talked on the Cloudcast uh, with Brian Gracely and Aaron about, about exactly this uh, it, self-training model. Is that mm -hmm. a fair? Yep. Um, and so, so I don't, I don't want to, as, as, as interesting as this self-training concept is, um, I want to I want to tell people to go listen to that podcast for more detail. Jump into just sort of fast forward to the implication of an edge infrastructure that's self training. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that so so that really defies conventional wisdom about needing the cloud as a backup, right? The the the, the thing I've been hearing people talk about for edge. I just got back from OpenStack edge infrastructure is basically saying applications are completely fluid. They need to move back and forth. Are you, are you, are you saying that that's not a fair statement? How do, you, how do you look at that? I think the edge, <clears throat> so let's talk about my scenario, Palo Alto. What's the application? The application is called, let's just say, predict what's gonna happen with downtown Palo Alto traffic. Right. Go write that up. There isn't a human on the planet who can write that app. The only way that that app exists is in the weights of a neural net. It's a kind of a program because if I put in some questions, I get some answers out, right? Right. Okay. And so the point is that for these edge apps, we need to learn the app from the data. The data, it's all about data. It's not like there aren't enough humans to write these apps for us, even if we could pose the questions. And so what we need to do is be able to take this data, much of which is pretty gray and horrible, and convert it into something semantically or, yeah, semantically useful that we can then use, right? We can query these things and say, what do you see about the world? What do you think the world was like? What's it like? What's it going to be like in five minutes? Okay. But that, that implies, so today when people think about doing that, they think of huge training sets. Yeah. Um, and they think of, and I've heard a, a whole bunch of discussions around, you know, now we're, now we're flipping into the AI worlds of, you know, how do you trust that that algorithm is accurate? You have, you have all sorts of. Yeah, let, let's, great. So let's dive into that quick. Yeah. So <clears throat> here's the very simple observation, which will not require homework um, about time, <laughs> time series data, right? Is if I, let's just say, which we, just, we get from traffic lights, one sample per second, <clears throat> and this is all the sensors in the intersection. If I throw those and a few other samples from time before, say to have a time window of two minutes, into a neural net with random weights, I get a guess out the far side of this thing. And then I, the cool thing is I get to compare it to the real world. I get to see what really happened. And the difference is an error. And the error is what I back propagate into my neural net to allow me to make better guesses next time. Okay. Right, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So every single sample turns into a training opportunity and also a prediction. And we have an opportunity to measure how the prediction changes over time. So we can just wait until it's good enough. Okay. Now there's an interesting, interesting theoretical set of questions as to whether or not these things will converge. That is, is the thing learnable, but in general, they're pretty robust. And right. you know, what you'd be surprised is that, you know, for us, a training set is, is exactly the same as an inference set, which is uh, a few hundred milliseconds that we're done. A few hundred milliseconds of data? A few, no, wow. no, 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 not of data, to compute okay. it. So we oh, get, a, okay. we get a, full, <laughs> a full set of samples, full set of samples going into a neural net, about a thousand inputs, and then a hundred milliseconds or so later, out comes the output. And you just watch and see what happened. 
Okay. And so, okay. The, but the cool thing is that, you know, with light, with, with a lightweight application architecture, we can talk about this, uh, the use of this distributed actor model in a sec. Right. Um, one can do this on really trivial amounts of CPU or GPU resources at the edge. So it doesn't require you paying this huge amount of money to move all the data up to the cloud. And what I just want to, it's okay. very important to realize that it is in the cloud guy's interest to get their whole, get their fingers on your data, right? And to have you believe that all these problems can only be solved there. <laughs> that is the mythology they want you to buy into that they can run their, your da the data centers better than you and that, that they can manage your data better than you. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 but in general, um, they can offer a fabulous infrastructure that's highly available and highly reliable and everything else. They just, they're missing the data scientist, right? The person who's going to make sense of this stuff. So what, what you're describing to me is, is from a training perspective, very different than generic training. You're, you've got a, a very finite set of inputs environmentally that that's not that hard to understand. You've got a relatively small set of, of, of feedback signals that you can use to, to improve. And then from that perspective, it's a much more constrained problem. It is constrained. Yes, you're quite right. There are some unique advantages to that, to, by the way. So in the way, just going back to traffic, the way we do traffic, every single intersection learns to predict its own future. And so it's training its own model. So, so Simon, when we train these models, it, you know, it's a much more constrained problem from that perspective. So, you know, that, that really reduces uh, what you have to learn. Are you saying that a stoplight would just start from, I don't know anything except red, red, yellow, green? Um, actually, not a stop, well, not a light, an intersection, which is probably intersection. 50, yeah. Yeah, an intersection is about 50 sensors. And, um, and the goal is to predict the future values of every one of those sensors. So inner loops and everything else. So would that, numbers, yeah. would that mean that the cost for adding a sensor from a computational model perspective would also go down? So right. you could go from 50 to 200 sensors and it wouldn't add a lot of training costs in this model? Well, so first of all, let me describe, and we're just gonna talk about this particular system. This is how it works. <clears throat> what comes at us is noise, well, noisy, horrible stuff, which is voltages as lights flip and as events happen on the road, okay? The goal is to find an entity, say uh, an intersection and its, um, and its sensors, and they'll report the same latitude and longitude. And then to dynamically configure a, an actor in this distributed actor model, which I'm gonna call also a digital twin, and however many sensors it shows up with, cool. That's how many it gets. All right. And then its job is to process its own data, analyze it, denoise it, and learn from it. So there's no, nothing we have to do. It just shows up from the data, gets created, goes off, parameterizes its own model, and goes off and trains and learns. Does that make sense? It makes, it makes a lot of sense. The, the concept of digital twin is another item I, I throw into the homework folder for people who haven't heard this, this concept, do you wanna, so instead of asking you to define it, how important is the, the digital twin concept in your model? That's eff effectively what Swim creates is for each entity that is reporting in the data, uh, a thing, an, an actor, which consumes the data from the real world sibling, okay? and is responsible for analyzing it, knowing its current state, and if it's relevant to the current problem, projecting its future values. So it is the fundamental concept, this whole, the use of local actors which consume data. And so let me contrast this with say having a database. Okay. If I get a, a data item for a thing, I could then take a 50 millisecond round trip to go and put it in some row column store someplace. Um, maybe do a bit of computation on the way. And so instead of having that, the actor just processes it and keeps it in memory and is stateful. So it's, it's running. It's like a process. It's running. 
And so we don't ever have to take the 200 millisecond hit, which is a few rounds, round trips to the database. And that's billions of CPU cycles. So I, I want to dig in on the actor model that mm -hmm. you're describing. Um, that's one, I, I, you know, I'm interested in, in how, you're, how you define the actor model, how you describe it architecturally. And then um, let's start there and then we'll, we'll, we'll dig in in some interesting places because this is architecturally important. Okay. What you're describing. <clears throat> Swim basically takes hold of whatever resources you point to that. And we, it can go down to little things like Raspberry Pis, um, but also runs in containers on, in the fog or even in cloud instances. It kind of smears like peanut butter on your toast. Um, and it builds a fabric. So a fully connected mesh between all these instances, it is aware of what resources are available in each one of these instances. So memory, CPU, GPUs, whatever. It knows what network bandwidth is available. And then um, data starts to show up. Data starts to show up someplace at some of these, in, at some instance. And at that instance, um, Swim starts to infer a scheme on the data. It's never seen this thing. So it starts to infer a scheme. It gossips that scheme amongst all the instances. They agree. And then these actors get created basically right where the data is. So as close as possible to the data, an actor will be created. An actor is really just a, an object which is stateful, which uh, is also active. And so its job is to process its own data, to know its current state, and perhaps its past and, it, and project its future. And you can, if you happen to know what your actors are, you can do all sorts of magical things. Um, you can dynamically bind your own functions to them in Python or whatever. Okay. But if you don't, it's just going to create sort of non-semantically bound actors, which are just going to analyze whatever data hits them. Okay. So, wow. Ahead. So you used Erlang as a comparison. I'm assuming this isn't Erlang. It's this is not, no, it's, it's not it's Erlang. Okay. It's, Look, so the core of Swim is, is Rust. Okay. Um, the entire code base is under two megabytes in size. Wow. Okay. Um, so the core is Rust, and that is really all that's needed to build this distributed fabric, um, manage actors, manage their persistence. Um, when actors update their state, it is acid. Um, okay. But distribution of actor state is eventually consistent. So if there is a network partition, I will eventually see the updates for an actor that I'm interested in. It inverts the notion of pub sub. So instead of pub sub, pub being, I'm going to throw stuff out there and sub if you want to get the update. Right. If you want an update, you sub, and then you continue to receive whatever there is capacity to send you. One of the assumptions that is interesting here is with an edge infrastructure, you're assuming it's relevant information for the environment, right? There's, there's not a lot of noise in that system. Um, except, right. It's, 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 it's not a hundred percent signal that you near know, there, the, the, the sensors are noisy, but, but there is no extraneous data for your system to, to process, or if there is, it should get filtered out by the, the, the analytics, right? Cor correct. Okay. Yeah. Wow, and, and so, so for people who are <laughs> thinking, that's a lot of capability for a small amount of code. Erlang is very lightweight from that perspective. What you're describing is, is in, you know, there, there's precedent here for this oh, type of mesh sure. functional system. Yep. It's, and and Ake is small, small too. I mean, Ake is a bunch of libraries for Java, right? We, there's a Swim implementation that is like that. There is, let me just, there is a key innovation which Swim has made, and that is this. So it's like programming an object-oriented system. It, it's just that there is a fundamental difference, which is that instead of having, you know, whereas normally you'd have an object reference in a language, the implication is the object that you're referring to is in the same memory address space as you. In Swim, the object reference is a URI. It's hidden from you. It's mapped onto some instance somewhere in this mesh, and you have no idea where. 
and Swim takes care of absolutely everything around getting hold of its data for you. In other words, you program an object-oriented model. You refer to elements or you know um, elements, uh, public elements, just displayed by the other object. But you have no idea that it's not sitting in the same memory space as you. So it could be somewhere else across the fabric. Swim is taking care of all of the weird stuff that could happen under your feet. This is this is sort of like um, with Erlang, where everything became an atomic function. You're, but you have a it's, you have a different model. Everything's network accessible. All right. objects are mm -hmm. basically there's a single pool of objects. It's not it's Swim's job to ensure locality when it can, but otherwise, man. No, 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 no. There's it's always as though it's local. So you refer simply to an object and its data items. Swim right. takes care of making sure that when you do that, the data that you want to see is in memory. You don't. It's, care. Is there an optimization that tries to bring you know, functional units for processing data or streams closer to the, the actual generation of that point? Does that a... Bingo. So SWIM moves processes <clears throat> to the optimal instance. Okay. And there are a whole bunch of things that does. Um, for starters, it moves the creation of digital twins to where the data is. It'll move more complex data processing functions to instances where there is memory and or other resources that are needed, for example, GPUs. Um, and so it, it just migrates them around the fabric as needed, but at the, at the application layer, I guess you could say, at the layer at which you might care to look at some code um, or write something, you are completely unaware of this. So it sort of just move stuff around. So let me see, no Kubernetes here. Um, or no DevOps. It just it just runs and moves the code around. The other thing is that swim uh, swim actors are highly available, and I guess you well you can go Ali, arbitrarily far down the path towards continuous availability. Um, let me describe that. So every update is delivered to two instances of an actor. One of them is marked as as um, the standby, and it just doesn't participate in any other logic. It's simply ready to take over. This is, and this is a, a, an artifact of being able to have an inherent mesh system. What you want, you're actually, you want to distribute resources throughout that mesh. So the, the more actors in the mesh, the, the more resilient your infrastructure is going to be. So you're going to take over every, every ca capability you can because you're trying to move things around. Correct. This is one of the things about edge computing that's so different than cloud and that, that you're describing. So I want to, I want to sort of summarize it and you can, you can tell me where I'm wrong. It is that in edge latency really matters. Resource utilization matters, right? We're resource constrained. And so we need architectures that detect that automatically detect latency, networking, resource capabilities and adjust without programmer intervention. Bingo. Okay, and, and that's class not cloud is not like that at all. Cloud has this infinite elasticity assumption. Um, you know, that's that's like the thing that makes cloud. So what what you're really saying is this, that's why this is not cloud. Edge is right. not edge. Edge has to account for all these these limitations. Plus, REST is stateless, and that works very well when you have this uniform pile of resource up in the cloud because it allows you to scale up and out. But um, in our world, the edge is stateful. So actors are fundamentally stateful. We don't take this 50 millisecond hit to go and put something in a database. Instead, what we have is a, is a, a mesh of actors, each of which is stateful and represents the current, uh, the past and projections for the future for itself and its data. And there is no database. Does, does that make it more stream processor like when you say it's not it's not it is stateful it's it's more about the stream state or is it because what's what more, you're just go ahead so let me make it concrete um i'll give you two examples one say go back to my example the traffic intersection there is an actor a digital twin for an intersection its job is to understand the past to the extent that we care about it right which might be how much, what's the share of red and green and blue and how many pedestrians and all that stuff, or how busy were you? Um, 
its job is also to know its current state and maybe to predict its future. Okay. Right. Now that's the stuff that you would normally put in a database. And what I'm saying is that stuff is simply in the memory address space of this object, which is also active, which is the intersection. If you want to know about its state, go and ask it. It has an API. Hey, what, but one of the things that, about a database that's really hard in these cases is, is coming up with a schema to capture that information. What you're yeah. describing to me is, it, is there's, a, there's a secondary benefit, which is there's no schema at all. It's, it's a learning, it's a self-tuning system. Right. And so we're, we're out of the whole, the, you know, the data scientists, I need to understand these inputs and put these weights on it, or I need this schema because I need a object to represent, you know, a traffic light and an object to represent a traffic sensor and an object to represent whatever, and then store them. Yes. So you're, you're saying none of that has to happen in this case. Correct. Correct. So what does writing a program look like in this model? Well, in this case, the basic part, which is I have all this data, um, come up with the essentially the entity model and let entities create themselves, write the program from the data. That's job one. And that program, by the way, is just the weights of the, of the CNM. That is quite literally, it is, if I put the following sets of inputs into the CNN, I'll get some predicted outputs. Right? Okay. Maybe I can say to watch your current state or something, but it, you know, you're learning a program for how this thing behaves. Um, the, the next thing up, which is perhaps something more sophisticated, like, well, where are, in a, how do I route my ambulance around the city? Yeah, that's a harder problem. Right? Okay. Right. And, and, that, and that might be something that you pull into cloud um, to collect all the data. Is there a way to take the information out of this edge, get a, get a coherent report? Sure. No, sure. Well, it's not even a report. So SWIM, as I said, smears, it smears across edge to cloud. And so um, it, you know, it just publishes these APIs. And so um, every time, so every new city, this thing gets rolled out into a bunch of new, a bunch of new intersection APIs show up in Azure because that's where they tend to get hit by the customers, which are the Ubers and Waymos and, and those kind of people. Okay. And so the API is simply, um, it's the way out from the edge, but there's another way of using this information again, which, conflicts with our normally accepted notion of cloud. If you are driving your brand new Audi through Palo Alto, you don't really need to go to the cloud to get to know what the intersection that you stopped at is going to do. You just need to talk to the intersection. It happens to be right in front of you. Right. That makes sense. So you're driving local decisions. It, but I, I guess the, the thing that I keep coming back to is lack of schema makes it really hard to build APIs to then do those integrations on top of it. So, right, my, my Audi coming up to the intersection can't just say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in the stream of data. No, that, that's true. However, the, I think the, the goal here is to, look, we can't do away with, I mean, it's a complex set of problems, right? The, the job is to make it so that normal humans skilled in the problem domain can easily identify and describe what's going on. And this has relevance not only in the traffic case, but in other industrial use cases where you might want to say, look, here's, here's all the stuff I'm seeing. And you watch how a human reacts to various analyses and says, and labels it and says, oh, that's the bearing and this is whatever it happens to be. So, you know, I think half of the problem always is you're going to live in the head of the person who's the expert or the, right. the local person. The key job is to make it so you don't have to be a data scientist to understand how to make use of the insights you can derive from data uh, to empower them. So does part of SWIM also then have this assistance in building the APIs to extract it? How do you know that you've got a good API, a good abstraction, uh, ex, abstraction but also extraction APIs for, for this? Uh, yes, part of it is that. So we have two, two parts of, to this. In, in most industrial contexts, um, 
you know, what they're interested in is an operator type UI. And there is an instance of, well, there is an implementation of Swim. It's just a JavaScript binding, which just runs in your browser. <clears throat> and so a simple XML configuration puts a bunch of cards up in your browser. You specify what things you want and what cards. And if you want, you can go and label them. Cool. And then you can make arbitrarily sophisticated user interfaces from that. I'll give you an example in a sec. Um, the other one, which is traffic, actually, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think with a week's effort, we were done. That is, you can start off with this very general capability of deriving insights from data, not being particularly, well, knowing nothing at all about what they are, and then making them useful in some context, right? So essentially, semantically binding them and making them useful to humans or other apps with a tiny amount of work. Is, is that part of the, the, the digital twin definition? Because digital twinning is definitely a human semantic for this IoT information. Yes. Right? Historically, I'd say the notion of digital twin came from the design side towards the physical world, right? So you might have a design time 3D CAD asset. It helps you to figure out what's going wrong in the thing that's in front of you and you're looking through HoloLens, say. We're trying to do it the other way, which is, and maybe we'll end up combining the two at some point. See what we can do just from data and whether we can define, we can derive something of use of value without being particularly semantically bound and then let the humans take it the rest of the way or tie it in, tie it in easily into some higher level application that somebody's using. I have one cool example there if you have a moment. Yes, please. <clears throat> We're in a, um, an aircraft manufacturing facility, which is drowning under RFID tag reads. Okay, it's so one mile long, 2,000 sensors, you know, whatever, 400 reads per second, millions of tags. And Oracle is fat and happy. Um, but that, it turned out, isn't the problem. The sim now here we knew what the problem was, and so we're defining digital twin. The digital twin is called an RFID tag. It's ten lines of code. It gets seen by multiple sensors. Okay, so it's getting continually updated as to I saw you, and he was a signal strength, and it uses that to triangulate off the sensors and place itself in the fab. So suddenly, instead of a database full of rapidly aging RFID tag reads, which I have to then process. What I have is a bunch of active tags and I can just ask any one of them, where are you? More than that, a very simple box around every tag gives me a proximity and I can suddenly watch undercarriage of an airplane coming together, okay? Because the right. proximity is all of these things come together and I have an undercarriage, okay. And so it changed, what emerged from that exercise, which was very, I mean, trivial programming exercise running on a Raspberry Pi, um, was a model which accurately mimicked the real world, okay? That is, these actors, RFID tags, turn into undercarriage sub-assemblies. And pretty soon they can now go and do things which are much more sophisticated, like predict when the undercarriage is going to be late or early or, or something else, right? And so, so you translate the problem domain quite dramatically for the customer. So I want to try and rede redefine what you, re-explain re what you just said, because it, it, it's blowing my mind right now. On, on mapping pro new problems, which I, with the problem you're describing of this, of this basically data-rich environment, 3D environment, into a, a schema, a database schema, is, is basically taking all of these active object, you know, and, and they're objects in the, in the, in the true object-oriented sense, but they're actors in your, in your, in your definition. And, and stuffing them into a schema basically is, is killing, you know, uh, maybe the wrong, that's, that's, in, in some ways that's the right word, because we talk about a live feed. As soon as you stuff them into a schema, you've basically taken live data and you've, you've, you've made it go flat, right? It's going to age. It's, it's useless. 
What you're doing by creating this actor model is every one of those sensors becomes a, basically a living entity, a living stream of data on the system that you can then interact with as a thing. And then the, the swim model is saying, oh, I have got, you know, I, I need information from here. I can then talk to these, these live actors. Well, it, it's even simpler than that. Every okay. actor can do a very simple thing, which is what's near me. Okay, and and it can subscribe to updates, pub sub style updates from any of the actors near me, and can tell you the actors it's close to. And so, what wow. emerges is a very simple model of actors coming together, which, by the way, forms another actor, right? Okay? Which turns out to be a sub assembly, and so the the models kind of just emerge from the data, which is very very refreshing. Is part of this modeling include the knowledge that it's a physical model? Because that, that strikes me part of, you know, if, if you're actually able to say, I know that you're a physical thing, you exist in space time. If you can start with that assumption, then it, it basically means that there's metadata on every actor that, that you can start assuming as you build the models. Is that, is that a component to this? Well, <clears throat> I mean, you could do with swim is a is a distributed object oriented system, okay? okay? Eventually consistent, and it handles all notions of distribution, persistence, and availability. And so you can write whatever you want. The interesting question is, can you take pretty gray data where you don't know an awful lot and infer things which turn out to be useful in practice cheaply or affordably? Um, for people looking for insights at the edge quickly, right? And it turns out there's, I think we've, we're finding that there is a lot to be gained there. So yeah, that makes sense. This okay, is the exact, the exact same system that predicts the traffic in Palo Alto. And by the way, if you want to see the traffic stuff at the summer running, go to um, smartcity.swim.ai and you can see a UI. Well, means look at the source code of the JavaScript. It's a couple hundred lines long, and then you're done. Um, but that same system is can predict, you know, predict 118 out of 120 battery failures for an organization that's doing uh, battery backup, uh, charging, and monitoring nationwide. And wow. the, reason, the reason it didn't get two was because a human got there first. <laughs> Interesting. No, it doesn't. It doesn't know what a battery is, and so it's up to you to decide if that's good or bad. From an edge data sensor thing, I, I think that you started on the right the right premise, which is if every sensor and every location has to be modeled by a person, not even AI, right? Not even a data scientist, just just modeled by a person we will not succeed or both both options are bad here or the cost per adding one of those sensors becomes hundreds or thousands of dollars and so right. we're going to have we're going to we're going to say well we've got 50 sensors in this intersection 200 would make a lot of sense but we can't afford the human cost of modeling 200 sensors per intersection or the fact that some have 50 and some have 200 so we're done but um, it, and it's worse than that. I mean, a McCain okay. traffic light is different than one from traffic wear and it, whatever, you know. All, so there isn't, there isn't a universal ontology for widgets with sensors on the edge. It's just impossible to do. So I, we, we're running out of time. I, <laughs> my head is still reeling because what you're describing still sounds like magic. And I feel like I've gotten smarter. Uh, I need another 90 minutes of, of, of Q and A to to dig, click down into the where the magic goes, and people need to read and look at what Swim AI has done. Um, one question for you: you're, you're famous for analytics and process and things like that. How much, totally totally away from Swim, how much of your thought processes are shaped by that in in building Swim AI and, and trying to determine this problem space? You know, SWIM started out as this tiny implementation of the distributed actor model. And then <clears throat> the problem is, and by the way, I think this is a broad challenge faced by everybody who's looking at the edge. The problem is 
how do you go and tackle a world which is hugely diverse? Every single customer, even if they're all yogurt factories, is going to be different. And how, so how do you deal with diversity? And so job one for us was to try and deal with this problem of picking out useful things to do just from the data itself because it seemed to us that that was the only way we could build a scalable business. Otherwise, we would be a PS business like everybody else. Right. So this is, this is fascinating because I, I do feel like you, you went to the core problem um, and, then, and then worked to solve that issue. Um, and of all the edge conversations we've had, which we've, we've had a lot of and I'm looking forward to a lot more, this has been a very distinctive approach in, in, in seeing edge as, you know, something that has to get resolved um, outside of human scale. Um, right. And that I really appreciate. We, we I love to talk about, you know, hundreds of thousands of edge endpoints. I think for what you're talking about, it's hundreds of millions. Right. Um, yeah, so Swim is massively scalable. I mean, just on Raspberry Pi, we'll happily deal with millions. It's just not a big deal. So Simon, um, thanks for joining us today. And um, you know, real quick, if people want to contact you or if people want to try out uh, the Swim technology, where should they go? Yeah. Um, what's the next step? Thank you. So I'm Simon at Swim.ai, uh, and I'll happily take questions. We are manically working on um, the Swim Academy, which is a way for to make to put Swim in the hands of everybody, um, and you know it's this funny thing, right? You've got to build a company and which is stave off the wolves, and um, and build stuff for people too. There's you've got to build a community around it, and we know the community is really important, so we're working very hard on that right now. So very shortly we will have something out. I'm hoping over the summer, uh, which will make it broadly available to people to use. Simon, we really appreciate you uh, joining us today. To our audience, uh, we hope you, you got quite a lot out of this. And obviously, we encourage you to go take a look at what uh, Simon is up to at SWIM. And uh, Simon, thanks again for joining us oh, today. Thank you, guys. Great privilege.